Hi, and welcome once again to Unstoppable Mindset. Today, I get to have the honor of chatting with an author and a person who was Miss Wheelchair in 2017. I've never met a Miss Wheelchair before, although my wife of 40 years was always in a wheelchair. So wheelchairs are not new to me, but a Miss Wheelchair is a new experience. And an <laughs> author, I have written books and love to talk to people who are authors and Kat Magnoli is definitely an advocate and a very prolific person in a lot of different ways, and we're going to get to all of that. So Kat or Catherine, whichever you prefer, whoever you are, <laughs> welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. Thank you so much, Michael, for having me today. This is such an honor to be with you, and let's get it started. Ask there you any go. question you'd like. Well, we got introduced by Sheldon Lewis, who also like... I do works at Accessibility, and Sheldon had uh, <clears throat> was interviewed on our podcast a long time ago. We had a great conversation, and he's been kind enough to tell us about other people like you ever since. So, well, let's start. Tell me a little bit about the early Catherine growing up, or the early cat growing up. You know, a child, and some of the early the early stuff about cat that we should know. Okay, well, first off, I am the youngest of seven children. I'm the only person in my family with a disability. And that was an interesting way to grow up because, you know, I was kind of sheltered. My parents were both very protective of me. But my siblings, you know, they never treated me as if I was in a wheelchair growing up. They always wanted me to be a part of the games that they were playing and they made sure that they adapted it to my needs. They, it, they never were like, oh, you can't do this, you know? And so I, I felt very accepted in that way. And I also, at the time, was going to a school just for children with disabilities. So I really never experienced at a young age, you know, any form of bullying or discrimination or anything like that. That is until I was eight years old and I was put into the public school district um, in a small town in New York called Yorktown Heights. Ah. And they, you know, I was the only person with a disability throughout all of my schooling. And that was when I really got to see how people without a disability treated those with a dis treated those of us with a disability. I went through a lot of bullying, a lot of ostracizing, a lot of, you know, oh, you're a liability, so you can't come on this class trip, or you can't come on the camping trip, or not being invited to birthday parties. I actually remember this one story um that you know, my neighbor had a birthday party and it was a pool party and I wasn't invited and she was in my class and all my classmates were there. And so they actually saw that I lived next door and they walked over to my house and the mother of the little girl was like, what's going on? Like, why did everyone leave? And my mom was like, well, you didn't invite my daughter. So now her classmates are coming to say hello. And the mother tried to fix the situation by inviting me. And my mom was like, nope, like you're not going. So that's one of the, the stories that I like to tell because it shows how great of a mom I have. And speaking of my mom, I just want to tell you this one other story about her. You know, as I said, I grew up in a large family and I was the only one with a disability in my family. And I asked her why that was. Mm. And she told me this beautiful story about the spine being like a magical tree. And she told me that it had these little magical leaves called nerves that help you move your arms and legs. And I'm missing some of my magical leaves. But then she went on to say that even though I can't walk, that I can do anything else that I put my mind to. So... That just gives you a little bit of a glimpse of the good and the bad of my earlier years. So to skip around a little bit, 
Okay. Um, I don't know how long ago, how long ago was that roughly? That may be giving away your age, but I'll ask anyway. How long ago was which one? Well, um, so the birthday let me just, party story. So let me do it this way. How old are you? I am 39 years old. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. So, so now, so the birthday party and all that stuff took place roughly 30 about years ago. Thir- about 30 years ago. Yes. Okay. So <laughs> here's, here's the question. Do you think that that kind of behavior would still be exhibited today? Um, I can't speak for all parents, um, so I don't know, but I can say this. I think that there's a really wonderful movement going on in society where the media and literature and all that is really starting to embrace the disability community more than they did, let's say, 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. So I think that there's more education about the disability community out there. And I think that that's helping make bullying maybe less, hopefully. I mean, I, I don't know. I can't really say. Yeah. You know, I think things from my perspective, I think things are better, but, and the but is that it's all about education. <clears throat> and there are a lot of people who still really haven't decided that disabilities are not something that makes us less than they are. And so it does depend on the individual. I think that there has been some progress, but we have, I think, a long way to go. Yes, I agree. And so that's something that we we have to work on. I know that as a person who is blind, I continue to see lots of challenges. And I think that the reality is that we emphasize eyesight so much in our lives uh, that we view people who who don't have eyesight or whose eyesight is less than perfect. um, We view those people as less than we are. We still haven't dropped the expression visually impaired. um, and, and that's got so many negative connotations because visually we're not different because we're blind, but the professionals adopted that a long time ago. And we continue to see impaired. Well, we're not impaired. You know, you're not mobility impaired. You use a wheelchair, you're in a wheelchair. But as your mom pointed out, that doesn't make you impaired or less than anyone else. Because while you can't walk, there are short people who can't do the things that taller people can do. And even tall people can't necessarily do all the things in the same easy way that some short people can do because they have to fit into smaller places sometimes or whatever the case happens to be. And what we don't really understand is that disability is not a lack of ability, but rather it's a characteristic. And we all have it in one way or another. I am 100% on board with what you're saying. And another thing that I I like to reiterate, it's kind of in the same sense of what you're saying, is that the disability community is actually a community that anyone can join at any time because someone can wake up and they can be blind or someone can wake up and get into an accident and then be in a wheelchair or someone can go deaf you know, maybe listening to too much loud music throughout their life, whatever the case may be, it or just like a gradual thing that happens as you get older, you know, Mm -hmm. and so it's, it's not something that's so taboo as maybe society has made it out to be throughout the years, because it really is like the most common thing that it's it's the only minority that anyone can join, you know? Yeah. Well, and I would submit actually something slightly different. I agree with you. But what I also would say is that the reality is every person with eyesight has a disability. Um, and I've talked about it on this podcast before. And the, the issue is that in 1878, Thomas Edison invented the electric light bulb. Well, why did he do that? He did that so that people with eyesight would have light on demand and would be able to function 
when it would otherwise be dark at night or whatever. And so over the years, we have put so much emphasis on developing the technology that light is around us pretty much all the time. <clears throat> but the but the other part about it is until it's not. Like if you're in a building and there's a power failure, you have to go scrambling whoever you are for a phone or a flashlight or something to turn on the light. And if you can't find one, you're in a generally a world of hurt because of the fact that it's dark and you can't see what to do. So every sighted person has the disability of being light dependent, whether they like it or not. And technology has mostly covered it up, but it doesn't change the fact that the disability is still there. We just, as a society, don't like to acknowledge that because light is so readily available most of the time. That is fascinating. I never really even thought of that. Um, I definitely, that, wow, that's amazing. See, that proves my point that you don't even have to go through an accident or anything that I just mentioned. Like, just take away something that helps you enhance that sense and that sense is no longer there. So it, it's, it's really interesting what you just said. I'm, I'm fascinated by it. We've got to get to the point where we recognize that disability does not mean a lack of ability. You know, yeah. people say, well, but disability starts with dis. Well, so does discretion. So does it mean a lack of crescent, whatever that is, or, <laughs> you know, any number of things. Dis doesn't need to be a negative term. And we've yeah. got to grow up to recognize that as a as a society. And I understand that people with eyesight do have advantages in some ways because the world has been created around what they have access to that a lot of us don't. But that doesn't mean that we're less than they, um, whether it's being no. in a wheelchair or whatever. Of course, of course, 100 percent. And actually, just to keep going on this topic for a second, I read an amazing book called No Pity. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. And no, I haven't, but that's okay. Go ahead. One of the things that they stress in the story, in the it's not really a story. It's actually like a, it's a book that talks about the entire history of the disability uh, rights movement. And one of the things that they stress in it is that disability no longer exists when you make things accessible to us. So for right. example, me, if if there's a ramp and there's a button for the door, I no longer have a disability because I can get into any building if mm -hmm. those things make it accessible for me. For for instance, for you, if there's braille, your disability goes away because you're able to understand and communicate in a in a better way by being able to read, you know, the bumps and the and the braille signage so you can know where to go in a building, let's say like the elevator. And so I think that that's a really cool concept that disability is kind of like perception only because if you make the world more accessible, then no one really has a disability. Like that's the flip side of it all. And that's the real point, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's that way. So are you a quadriplegic or a paraplegic? Paraplegic. So, so you, uh, so you can hit people upside the head if they uh, start getting too insulting about people with disabilities, right? We'll leave it to you. <laughs> I try to be very nice and to educate first. <laughs> yeah. But if they don't listen, then I might have to run over a toe or two. My wife, when sometimes we've gone to places, even like Disneyland, although it's been a while, got so very frustrated because being in a chair and she also was a para, um, we could be talking and sitting somewhere or just walking along and people just jump over the footrests rather than having the consideration to walk around because they're in such a hurry to get somewhere. People are, people are amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's one of my biggest pet peeves. Another one is people just 
wheeling me up a ramp, like as I'm wheeling, and then someone of total stranger will come up behind me and think that they're doing a kind gesture. Yeah. And just start pushing me up the ramp. And it scare it startles me, you know, it scares me. So I always flip it out, you know, to the other side where I'm like, how would someone feel if I just like started pushing them on their backside and like telling them to essentially walk faster? You know, like that's not very nice. I wouldn't be able to do that. I'd probably get arrested if I did that because you can't just put your hands on someone's backside and start pushing yeah. them. Yeah. So it's the same concept. People think that they're doing something nice or that they're, you know, you know, not bothering us by like asking us to move over or whatever. I'd rather you say, excuse me, than push me or jump over me. You know, or, I'd rather you acknowledge me and be like, excuse me, I need to get through. Like, or, that's the kind way to do it. Or um, do you need help? I'd be glad to push you up the, the ramp if you would like. I mean, but the yes. point is to ask. Exactly. The point is to ask. It's really not that hard. <laughs> no, it's not that hard at all. So I'm curious, um, what do you think of the truncated domes, all the the, the dots that go across uh, driveways and so on to warn people when you're at the bottom of a, of a ramp or or going into a street? They've put those out saying blind people need to have those warnings and so on. What do you think of that as a person in a wheelchair? Well, let me say this. If it is good for people with blindness, then I think it's necessary. However, for a person with a disability, again, it can be kind of a hazard almost, I will say, because let's say one of my wheels, you know, gets stuck in between one of the bumps. I could fall forward mm -hmm. like if it's a poorly made um structure you know i could fall forward so for me it can sometimes be a hazard and it has been in the past however if it's good for people with blindness then i'm all for it and i'm accepting of it and that's all that i'm going to say about it the the place where it becomes valuable is not so much on ramps or even um in train stations, because if a blind person is using a cane properly, they will be able to detect the edge of a um, a train, well, of a train track. Or if the tracks are dropped down, like in a lot of subway stations or whatever, um, the, the comment is, well, you have to have it so blind people know that they're coming to the edge. That's what the cane does, although a lot of people don't necessarily use their canes well. So the compromise was to put those those dots in but i know my wife hated them because it just shook her violently every time we went over them yeah i definitely have noticed with my friends who have spinal cord injury that tend to have spasms below the waist that it does trigger you know well for her it more shook her neck and, and it's very sad you know yeah well it's 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 one of those things that that um, there are places where where they can help if you've got a very flat curb, not even a curb cut or a ramp, but it's such a gradual ramp down that you don't really notice it. And the curb is or the entrance to the street is flat so that you don't really have a noticeable debarkation between the sidewalk and the street. There is a place where it's relevant to put something. But, yeah, it's it's interesting. Everyone has different challenges and. Um, some people love the, the, the dots and some people don't, and it's always a matter of trying to figure out the best way to make it as accessible and usable by the most or by most everyone. And people have to adopt and adapt to different ways of doing stuff. Well, I'm actually going to flip the question and ask you something now, if that's okay. Oh, sure. This is a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> what is your opinion about ramps as a person who's blind? Does it hinder you or help you in any kind of way? If or does it not affect you at all? Well, if it's a ramp, that's why I mentioned the very flat curbs. So 
from from my perspectives, I can go either way, ramps or stairs. However, um, it is my belief that ramps are very important. So I don't mind at all having ramps, but I don't believe that ramps enhance my ability to walk around because I'll use a cane or a guide dog and I will go where I need to go. And if there's a ramp, it's fine. If there are stairs, that's fine. And I realize that stairs generally take up less room than ramps. But having been married to a lady in a wheelchair for 40 years, I totally value ramps and have never had a problem with ramps. So ramps don't bother me at all. Okay. That's interesting. So, um, and I am a firm believer that, <clears throat> that ramps need to be available, not just in the back of a building or whatever, but they should be readily available so that people in chairs or people who need ramps, um, people with strollers, just older people can walk in the front entrance of a building just as easily as, as I can, even though I can walk up the stairs. So I'm fine with ramps. Okay. Well, thank you. That That's very interesting to hear. So it is uh, kind of one of the things that uh, that we we all do deal with, but uh, I think I'm what I'm really surprised at is, and we watched we watched my wife passed away last November, so it's just me now. But as I tell people, um, she's up there somewhere, and if I misbehave, I'm going to hear about it. So I got to be a nice guy. Oh well, I'm so sorry for your loss. Well, it's been 40 years. And as I say, the spirit sometimes moves faster than the body and her body just finally kind of gave out. And uh, it is what we have to deal with. But, you know, the the other the other side of that is that, um, you know, I learned a lot from her and having 40 years of memories and marriages is, is a good thing. And yeah. uh, it. it it helped broaden perspectives in a lot of different ways. So I certainly have no complaints about it. That is so beautiful. Oh my goodness. You're going to make me cry. Oh. <laughs> well, like I said, she's somewhere. And if I misbehave, I'm going to hear about it. So I will, uh, I will continue to just be a, a, a decent person and behave well. That's all. We, <laughs> that's all that all of us can do. Yeah. That's Hopefully. about all there is. Right. That's all we can do. Yeah. So tell me um, a little bit more about you. You grew up. Did you go to college? Yes, I did. I actually got my AA degree, my associates in arts degree for exceptional student education. I really wanted to be a teacher for children with disabilities However, due to my health, that ended up not being the case. Um, but I still have my degree, which is great. <laughs> what do you think of the, the terminology, exceptional children? Um, I think a lot of the time we spend too much time nitpicking yeah. at terminology. I think whatever a person is comfortable with is very like subjective. Like there are some people that don't like people first language. They don't like the term people with disabilities. They yeah. like the term disabled, disabled person. person. I personally do not. I like people first language. I like yeah. to be seen as a person that has a disability. So I think it's just all, it's very subjective. It's however you feel. But, you know, the, the school district felt like it was a better transition to go from special ed or special education to exceptional student education. And, you know, the only thing I would say about that is that, um, and I agree with you about people first, by the way, but I also think that we have to look at terminology in the light of what does it convey to people about us? Like I mentioned, visually impaired. Um, the fact of the matter is that continues to promote the concept that we're less. So a much better term, such as like 
happens with people who are deaf. It's not deaf or hearing impaired. It's deaf or hard of hearing. And that is what the deaf community likes with good reason. And so visually impaired isn't nearly as progressive and as helpful attitudinally and socially as blind or low vision. And so I think there is some relevance to recognizing that terminology can be part of the problem rather than always being part of the solution. I 100% agree. And that's why I think that as a person within the community, when someone approaches you, whether it's you or I, it's our obligation to educate them and let them know how we want to be referred to. Because yeah. again, there might be some people in your community that don't mind the term visually impaired. Maybe that's right. how they refer to themselves. And know? there are, and there are. And, and so I, I, again, I think it's really about how we educate others on how we want to be addressed. Well, that's part of it. And the other part is, uh, and I've had discussions with some people say, I don't, I, I'm visually impaired. I'm impaired. I'm visually impaired until they think it through or until somebody talks with them about it and gets them to really explore what they're saying when they say impaired, for example. Yeah. Um, and that, that's part of it. And so in the blindness world, we haven't grown up yet nearly as much as say people who are deaf have in terms of not being hearing impaired, but rather hard of hearing. So the the fact is there there are people who are blind and I've had discussions with them who say, no, I'm visually impaired. And and I point out the issue. And if I get them to think about it, they usually come back and say, I never thought about it that way. Just like yeah. we talked about earlier every person on this planet has a disability. And the fact is that most people are light dependent and that's a disability too. That's so true. Yeah. And actually it's interesting because a few years ago, I had the privilege of making friends with a man named Daniel Ruiz, who is a big advocate for the ADA, which mm -hmm. is for all of you that might not know is the American with Disabilities Act law. And so he makes places accessible, so on and so on. And one day we got into a discussion about the word handicap. And I never knew what that term actually means. And I don't know if you know either. Maybe you do. But for all your listeners, I just want to say that handicap actually means hand in cap. Which, yep. was, which is a symbol of saying that people with disabilities are needy and we're beggars and we're, you know, it's just, it has such a horrible connotation to it. So that's one term that I will not accept to be called. Um, whenever someone says like, oh, handicap parking, I'm like, no, it's accessible parking. Right. You know, like I make, that's the only thing that I'm like a stickler on um, is handicap and also crippled. I don't like the term crippled. I yeah. think that that is something that degrades me. Again, I go by people first language, and that just really is, you know, the case for me. Well, and I think it's a matter of of really people just accepting that we're as equal as they. And unfortunately, though, some of the language doesn't necessarily imply that. And that's what we really have to deal with, which is why anything that utilizes the word impaired is a problem, but people have to grow to deal with that in their own way. And that's something that we just will have to work on over time. Um, and hopefully people will come to recognize it is a problem. Just like when we talk about race, um, you know, we talk about African-Americans or, or, mm -hmm. or people who are black as opposed to other terminology that nowadays um, it is frowned upon to say um, exactly in, in in most cases, although black people sometimes use that terminology amongst themselves. But by the same token, we need to recognize that there are words that promote 
negative and less than stellar attitudes in a lot of different ways. So it's it's a challenge. Well, going back to something I had said earlier when you asked me, do I think that the same kind of incident would happen now in relation to, you know, how I grew up? I think the more and more we are exposed in the media in a positive light Mm -hmm. through books, through movies, through TV, through songs, whatever the case may be, I think through politics, I think that the world will kind of shift its perception the more they see what we can do. And I agree. Um, We need to be more involved in the conversation and I think more people need to help bring us into the conversation and talk about us or talk with us. And it's a slow process because changing a societal attitude like that is a, is not a a simple thing. It is a, is a challenge for a lot of people because they've grown up thinking something totally different. And now we're saying, no, you really need to change that. That just doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, it's it's interesting when um Coda won in the yeah in the Oscars, I asked my friend, his name is Mark McGuire, how he felt about it because he's a person living with deafness and he was like, So I didn't win. He's like, I don't care. Like <laughs> so I thought it was like such a tremendous thing. Yeah, me too. For- the disability community and someone living with deafness was like, okay, you know, like he didn't, he didn't acknowledge it as like this huge thing as maybe I did. Well, Um, but I I spoke, interesting. I spoke at a conference later that same year, um, um, a conference on inclusion here in California for one of the County departments of education and um, had occasion to, interact with several people who are very active in the deaf community. And of course, needless to say, they loved it. So yeah, it's different for different people. Yeah, exactly. So you got an AA degree and then what did you go off and do with yourself? And then, like I mentioned, my, my health kind of took a turn for the worse. I had developed kidney failure and was on dialysis. Oh, and this was actually during the time that I was still going to school. So when you're studying to be a teacher, you have to do what's called clinical hours, which means that you go into a school and you kind of shadow the teacher and you learn from her by interacting with the kids, grading papers, doing things like that. And one of the places that I did this was at a school called Kesher LD, which is a school for children within the autism spectrum and other learning disabilities. And that's really what inspired me to become an advocate because one thing that I didn't mention earlier is that with all the bullying that I had endured at a young age, it kind of actually depleted the message of the magical tree for me and made me feel like maybe there is something wrong with me. So when Mm. I got the chance to be around these kids with disabilities and really see their inner strength and see how amazing they were, it helped me re-accept my own disability at the age of 24, 25. Mm -hmm. So so that's when I started to think, okay, if this teaching thing is not going to happen for me because, you know, my health is not, allowing me to dedicate the time that's needed for this, how else can I help the disability community? So one day I'm sitting in a pool and I'm noticing that there's two children who are quote unquote, able-bodied or non-disabled, whatever term you like. And they were staring at me. They were trying to figure out how I got in the pool from my wheelchair And one of the kids actually said that he felt sorry for me. Mm -hmm. I was so sad that he would feel sorry for me that it dawned on me how I could help be an advocate. And I thought like after much thinking, I was like, I want to educate children 
about disability because they're the ones most curious about it. So how do I do this? And then I thought about something that I've always loved to do, which is write. And that's when I decided to write a children's book called The Adventures of Catgirl, which is about a superhero in a wheelchair, and she helps kids who are being bullied. And um, you've written several books now, haven't you, as I recall? Yes, there are four stories in the Cat Girl series. They each touch on a different kind of bullying. So we have bullying of children in wheelchairs, bullying children who are deaf, bullying children who are overweight, and racial bullying. Those are the four topics that I cover in my Cat Girl series. And then I have another story called Pete the Private Eye, who's actually a blind detective and he uses his magical cane to help him solve mysteries of lost objects. Hmm. Well, you know, all I have to say is that if you ever decide to do a picture book on the disability of politicians, don't worry, they deserve bullying. <laughs> just, just. I love that idea. I love to tell people I'm an equal opportunity abuser. We don't do politics on Unstoppable Mindset because I'll pick on all of them. <laughs> and rightfully so, but, you know. Yes. But especially that's cool. <laughs> yeah, boy, especially now is right. <laughs> so do you, do you self-publish or did you self-publish or do you have a publisher for the books? So when it came to the Adventures of Cat Girl series, I went through my grandparents who at the time had owned an educational toy business called mm. Dexter Educational Toys. And when I came to them with this idea of my book series, my grandfather was a little hesitant, but my grandmother jumped on the idea and she really, you know, used her resources of a printing company that she was in affiliation with to help publish the book. Cool. And with Pete the Private Eye, I used another company um, called Print Ninja. They're in China, mm -hmm. and they do a fabulous job with printing as well. That's great. Do you have any other books coming out in the future? I hope so. I do have a lot of ideas. I have some crossover stories of Catgirl and Pete that I really would love to, you know, have them meet in a story and work together and use both her magical wheelchair and his magic cane and just kind of have fun, you know, maybe finding lost items for bullies. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> that could be the crossover story. So um, you sent me several photos. I'm assuming some of those are the book covers. Yes, there. Oh, I did send you one photo that has all four cat girl book covers plus the cat girl puppet. The reason I ask is that all I see are titles that say like IMG something, so I don't, oh, I don't okay. get a description. So that's okay, but uh, I'm, gl I'm glad you did because I would have asked you to send them if you hadn't. So that's great because <laughs> we want to make sure they get into the podcast notes and so on, because I want other people to read the books, needless to say. Thank you. So that's kind of important to be able to do. But, you know, so you've written them. So did you, so what did you do for a job along the way? Uh, did you go into teaching? Did you start advocating? Um, did you start your own company? What did you do? Well, First and foremost, my number one passion is my book. So I've dedicated a lot of the time of my advocacy to reading to children and selling my books to schools and at different events throughout Florida and in other states. And then from there, because I did still have a desire to be a teacher, I did some tutoring for about a year or two through a girl that I knew named Sauda that I had met in college. So I did get to do some teaching, 
later on in my advocacy. And then, you know, as I grew as an advocate, different organizations started to reach out to me to do work with them. So for a while, I was working at the Center for Independent Living. Mm -hmm. And then I worked a little bit for Shake a Leg Miami, which is a wonderful organization that helps people get with disabilities get the chance to go sailing and kayaking and canoeing. And so I have had some like, odd jobs here and there, but all have to do with disability and advocacy in some way. But my main focus is my books and public speaking. <laughs> you definitely kept active. Yes. <laughs> so my mom in, calls me the energizer bunny. That there I you go. <laughs> well, so cat girl was in a wheelchair or is in a wheelchair, right? Yes, she is. So did you involve um, in any way in any of the books dealing with autism? I have since not, you since you've had a lot of interest in that and exposure to it. I have not had the chance to write a story about autism yet. I really want because the children that started my journey into advocacy do fall into the autism spectrum. I want to be as sensitive and correct with it as possible. Mm -hmm. So I want to do more research and make sure that I do that community the justice that it deserves when I write about it. We've come a long way with autism. I know I've talked to several people on the podcast here who discovered that they were on, as they say, the autism autism spectrum, but they discovered it in their 30s and in their 40s because we just didn't really know enough about it earlier on to mm -hmm. recognize it and diagnose. Yeah, yeah. And to be honest, you know, sometimes parents are, hesitant, even if there are clear as day signs, you know, um, a, that their child is in the autism spectrum, sometimes parents can be hesitant to get that diagnosed. And then the person will make that decision later on in life to finally get the, the test that helps them, you know, be diagnosed. Right. Um, or it just never came up and they never, no one ever thought about it, but yeah, it, it is a challenge. And I think that that's, you bring up a good point in general that a lot of times parents of children with disabilities don't really want to necessarily deal with it either. And it's mostly because they haven't themselves become educated. Your parents were fairly unusual and um, the same with mine. The doctors told them when it was discovered I was blind at the age of four months that they should just send me to a home. And they said, absolutely not. He can grow up to do whatever he chooses to do. But parents that are willing to really step out like that are much rarer than we would like to think sometimes. You know, I've been beyond fortunate to have the mother that I have. And I, I'm grateful for it every single day of my life because my mother was unaware of my having spina bifida throughout her entire pregnancy. It did not show up on any ultrasound um, that she had had during the nine months that she was carrying me. And so when I was born, that was the day that her and my father had found out that I indeed had spina bifida. And she always tells me this story because, as I mentioned, I'm the youngest of seven. So she would read a lot of medical books every time she was pregnant. And she always skipped over spina mm. bifida. She was like, oh, that'll never happen. And when it did happen, she didn't feel sorry for herself. She immediately, when she came home from the hospital, you know, started doing research, started calling different organizations like March of Dimes and all these other organizations that could help her, you know, raise me in the best way that she could. So I'm just very, very fortunate to have a mother like I do. Yeah, she learned and she dealt with it, which is which is great. And presumably she's still alive and uh, and helping. 
she's 72 years old and she's the one who's truly the energizer bunny. She's unstoppable. <laughs> well, then we need to get her on the podcast. It's good to have unstoppable people on the podcast. She's actually sitting right next to me, but she's shaking her head. No, that. Oh, come on. <laughs> Mom, can you just wave, please? Nope. She's well, I'm not going to see her wave, so that's OK. Well, but that, she waved to everyone. <laughs> she waved. Yeah. Well, it's neat to have a very supportive person. And that goes both ways because you give back and I'm sure help her in a lot of different ways. And just the very fact that you do what you do totally validates everything that she's done. Yeah. Yeah. I we, actually just recently um, got a proclamation from Palmetto Bay, which is a, a neighboring town from Sunny Isles Beach. And they gave me a proclamation to uh, honor Spina Bifida Awareness Month, which is within the month of October. Mm -hmm. And my entire speech was dedicated to my mom, pretty much. I mean, I, I spoke for like four minutes and three and a half of it was all about how wonderful she is. <laughs> and rightfully so, no matter what she thinks or says. <laughs> I agree. Like I said, moms who are and parents in general who are that much risk takers are very rare in, at least in my experience and from everything I've observed. So it's great to have that kind of a, a really wonderful person in your life. So that's great. Yeah. Well, now, um, did even though you don't you haven't dealt with an autism an autistic person yet in your books did they have some involvement in inspiring you to write the books they were a hundred percent the inspiration because while i was having the privilege to teach them i saw how they were able to handle episodes of bullying far better than i did when i was a child and it just was so inspiring to me. And I was like, wow, they have a strength that I did not have at 9, 10, 11, 12 years mm -hmm. old. And so it just really, it, it really did inspire me a lot. And they were part of the reason other than the two children in the, in the pool that had the curiosity about me. If I put it all together, it was like a, a melting pot of inspiration for me that, of why I wrote the Adventures of Catherine. I was at an Ikea store in California once and a young man came up and said, I'm sorry. And I said, why? And he said, because you can't see. So I've experienced the same sort of thing that you did. And yeah. we could, we didn't get to have much of a discussion about it because his mother dragged him away. Don't, don't talk to that man. You know, we shouldn't do that. And uh, people miss out on great education opportunities sometimes needless to say. Yeah. Yeah. And that's another thing that I really try to stress to parents that it's OK for your child to talk to me. It's OK for them to ask what happened. It doesn't offend me. If anything, them staring and the parent pulling them away is what offends me. Yeah, that that hurts my feelings more so than the child coming up to me and asking me about my chair. You know, yeah. and asking me what happened, I would much rather that. And so I've actually gotten into the habit of, do you mind, like asking the parent, do you mind if I tell your daughter or your son what happened? They seem to be interested in my chair. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I experience a lot of that or, um, and sometimes actually promote it to get conversation started. Um, a lot of times I'll be walking somewhere with, uh, with my guide dog and parents say, Oh, don't, don't, don't go up to that man. The dog might bite you and all that. And I'll stop and I'll yeah. almost block their way and say, let me, let me talk to you about what guide dogs are. And then I'll also take the harness off, which is the thing that the dogs love the most because then they know they're not working. And the last thing they want to do is to, avoid getting attention, especially from kids. So yeah. we get lots of opportunities. And when I go to speak 
to schools. <clears throat> it's always fun after the speech to take the harness off and let the kids come up. And the dogs have figured out that if they lay down and stretch out every which way they can, as far as they can, and maximize petting space, they'll get more kids to pay attention to them, and they love it. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, they they enjoy it a lot. So it's it's fun <laughs> to do. That's wonderful. Yeah. So do you, now you've, you've started your own organizations to help with advocacy, right? Yes, I within the last two and a half years, started Cat Girl and Friends, Inc. It is a 501c3 that just helps educate people about the importance of inclusion through literature and my public speaking. And it just gives me a chance to reach a larger audience. How far have you traveled to be involved in doing speeches and do public speaking? I actually went to the American Association School for Children Who Are Deaf, hmm. and that was in Atlanta, and it was really, really amazing. It was such an incredible experience. All the kids were signing their questions to me, which unfortunately, I don't know sign language, so there was... <laughs> an interpreter there, but it was just such an amazing experience that I never forgot. And I'm so grateful to have done. And I also got to go to New York where unfortunately I couldn't be at the school because it was during like COVID regulations mm. still, but I did a zoom session for a school in the district that I grew up in, which is Putnam Valley school district. Um, so that was really cool to be able to do. And I've actually done that two times since then, um, where I've done Zoom sessions for them. So I've been able to reach different schools in different um, states, as well as make a pretty good impact in in my community as well. Well, it's, I think, extremely important for us to recognize that one of the best things that we can do is to help teach and educate. And I, and I didn't tell you this, but when I was in college, I also went through the University of California at Irvine um, uh, College of Teaching. So I have my secondary teaching credential as well. So I, I, I never did teach professionally as a teacher in that sense of the word. But I ended up being very involved in sales, and I believe that that the best salespeople are also teachers as well, because that's what they should really be doing. Rather than trying to force a product on someone, they should be educating people and helping them come to the best decision for whatever they need. And uh, that's a philosophy that has worked really well. But I love teaching. And after September 11th, for me, um, I decided to take up a career of speaking and so on, because if I could help people move on from September 11th and teach them about blindness and disabilities and such, then it was a worthwhile thing. And if it changes one person, it's all worthwhile. That's such amazing advice and a, an amazing perspective. And I could not agree more. I mean, when I first started this, I was like, you know what? I want the whole crowd to hang on my every word. Now it's not so much like that for me. I just get so excited when I can lock eyes with one child or one person in the crowd. And I know that they're really paying attention and they're really being impacted by either my, the stories that I've written or my personal story. Whatever's resonating with them is, is so important to me. What's the most interesting question? Um, that any child has asked you when you've spoken like that? <laughs> um, we all have those stories, I'm sure. I, I feel like they ask the same questions over and over again, no matter where I am, which is always, how do you get up in the bed, like out of bed in the morning? How do mm -hmm. you brush your teeth? How do you take a shower? How do you get in and out of the car? How do you do these things that I'm just... So those kind of questions I find to be the most fun to answer. 
Um, the one that I think is so important, to, well, let me rephrase that because those are important questions to answer as well, because it's educating people about my daily life and how I get around from point A to point B. But the the subject matter that I find to be most interesting when they talk about it is when they start talking about episodes of bullying that they went through, and then we can start opening up that conversation. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, and it, and it's fun. I love speaking to children because they are uninhibited and they don't hesitate to ask questions. Once you start getting them engaged at all, they will, they will ask anything. And if we, we can have a, a session and the parents aren't around, it really works out a whole lot better because they will, they will become engaged and they'll ask questions. I remember, and I've talked about it here a couple of times, I, I spoke to a um, an elementary school and this third grade boy got up after I spoke because I opened it for questions. And his question was, how do blind people have sex? So oh, there my. you go. <laughs> and I have not been asked that by a child, but I have been asked by that adults by yeah. who wanted to take me out on dates. So. <laughs> Well, there you go. Opportunity knocks. Well, for me, when he asked that, I, I'm not dumb, right? I just said. Sorry for the background noise. That's okay. Um, I, I'm not dumb. When I was asked that, I just said the same way everybody else does. And if you want to know more, go ask your parents, because I wasn't going to get into that. Yes, that is a very smart answer. <laughs> but for as far as you, you know, so two guys wanted to take you out on, on dates. There's an opportunity, maybe. Yeah, I mean, when this was mostly in my 20s where people wouldn't even ask my name before they asked, can you have sex? I mean, I just was like, hi, my name is Catherine. And yes, <laughs> I can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and if you want to know more, that's a different story. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> ah, people are interesting, aren't they? Yes. But you know, true. we we cope and we we learn. And uh hopefully we do get to to help teach them. And that's what's really important about the whole thing. So tell me about winning Miss Wheelchair Florida. <laughs> It was really amazing. It was actually a funny story because I had been in the top three two times before. I had gotten second runner-up and first runner-up. So the third year, I actually wasn't going to participate. I was like, okay, clearly I'm not meant to win. I'm just going to take a break from this. But the state coordinator actually reached out to me like a day before the uh, application was due to be a contestant. And she was like, why haven't I received your application? I'm like, oh, because I'm not doing it this year. She's like, yes, you are. You have to do it. <laughs> so I was like, all right, fine, I'll do it. But if I lose again, like I'm never doing it again. So, <laughs> so I ended up going and it's an amazing weekend um, where girls with all different physical disabilities come together and we do workshops, we do, you know, judging. We, it's just so amazing. Um, and so I was really happy to be a part of it again. But I went into it not thinking that I was going to win or place in the top three or anything like that. So I went in with a different perspective of just enjoying the moment. And that's interesting because I ended up enjoying it so much that I ended up mis messing up my speech. And so I really thought I wasn't going to win. So when they announced the, you know, second runner up and first runner up and I wasn't called, I was like, OK, I didn't make it even to the top three. So when they said <laughs> my name, my mouth dropped and I started crying for like a good five minutes. And I was trying to speak because they handed me the microphone and I honestly couldn't even tell you what I said because I was that shocked for winning. And before they said my name, I actually looked at my mom in the crowd and I shook my head no 
it's not me. And at the same time, one of the judges was looking up at me and she was shaking her head like, yes, it is you. And I was just so confused as to why she was smiling <laughs> at me and shaking her head. So it, it was just an interesting uh, situation. And then when I did win, I got to meet the governor, uh, the former governor, Rick Scott. I got to work alongside the mayor of Sunny Isles and the mayor of Ball Harbor, which is another town, and get more beaches accessible in my area. I got to work with the school district, which is Miami-Dade School District, to have activities for Disability Awareness Month and Inclusion Week. I had a podcast. So it was a really, really busy time for me, and it was a lot of fun. I also got to do a lot of adventurous things, like go to iFly, which is indoor skydiving. And I got to, you know, just do some really memorable things. So did you do the indoor skydiving? Yes, I did. I would like to do that. I've never done it. I'm going to have to <laughs> go do it. Some. I would love to do that. Yeah, it's it's really, really cool. It's a very interesting simulation of what skydiving would be like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like to do it sometime. I'll have to to work that out. Well, so what's next for you? What are you doing? What are your plans and where are you headed? What's oh, your mindset wow. in the world? <laughs> well, currently I'm doing a lot of things. It is Disability Awareness Month and Spina right. Bifida Awareness Month. So I've been making a lot of videos on social media, just talking about basically what we're talking about right now, which is all that we can do. So that's number one. That's that's part of what I'm doing. I'm also doing a lot of different events for my books um, to have more of an outreach for them. I am part of the Christopher Reeve Foundation, where I'm a regional champion for them, which means that I speak to senators within my state about different laws that the Christopher Reeve Foundation is trying to get past. So that's that's basically what I'm doing. I'm also, um, in addition to it being Disability Awareness Month and Spina Bifida Awareness Month, it's also Domestic Violence Awareness Month, which for whoever does not know, people with disabilities are three times as likely to be victims of any kind of abuse. So myself, along with my mentor, Debbie Beats, are going to be partnering for a workshop with the Christopher Reeve Foundation in the end of October, where we're going to be talking about the intersectionality of abuse and disability. Wow. So you're definitely keeping busy, no doubt about it. Yes. Oh, and one last thing, I am working currently with Sunny Owls Beach to get even more beaches accessible in my town. So that's the last thing that I'm doing. <laughs> well, just one more thing, right? <laughs> yeah, just one more. Well, this has been a lot of fun. If people want to reach out to you and maybe contact you, learn more about what you're doing and so on, how can they do that? They can actually reach me through my website, catgirlandfriends.com. And cat and is K-A-T. Yes, cat, cat is K-A-T. Girl is G-I-R-L and is spelled just as we know, A-N-D, friends, F-R-I-E-N-D-S, dot com. Dot com. Yes. Okay. Any other contact ways or things that people should know? They can also just email me at cat, that's also K-A-T, magnoli, M-A-G-N-O-L-I, at gmail.com. Wow, a Gmail address without any numbers in it. You must be the first one. <laughs> yeah. Well, Kat, this has been a lot of fun. And I want to just say right now that when you have more adventures and you have, whenever you want to come back on and chat some more on Unstoppable Mindset, I would love to do it. So you just know you have an open invitation. We can talk about it at any time, but I really value you doing this. And if you know of anyone else 
And likewise, for any of you listening, if you know of anyone who we ought to have as a guest on Unstoppable Mindset, I'd love to hear about it. You can let me know. Kat knows how to reach me. But for all of you, just so you know, you can reach me at Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I, at Accessibe, A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-E dot com. Or go to our podcast page, www.michaelhingson, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I-N-G-S-O-N dot com slash podcast. And love to hear from you. Love to hear what you think about the episode. And as I said, if you know of anyone you think we ought to have as a guest, I definitely want to hear from you. We would appreciate you giving us a five-star rating. We value your ratings very highly and really hope that you liked the podcast enough to do that. So once... Once more, I want to thank you, Kat, for being here. I'm sorry, you were going to say? No, I was going to say thank you so much for having me. This has been such an amazing conversation. And I can think of so many people that I know who are advocates that would really shine on your show, um, really have such incredible stories to share. So I will be reaching out to some of them and encouraging them to reach out to you um, because I think that we all should come together and work together and share stories. I think that's the real way to educate and, and build inclusion for the, for the world. Um, Last question that I have, when will this be airing? Um, It's going to be a little while yet because we've got a, a number of podcasts that are out there, but we'll definitely be sending you an email unless there's some need for you to have it um, airing at a particular time. But It'll be a little while yet, but we'll keep you posted. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And I hope you guys have a great night.